This meeting is being recorded. What? Hmm. <laughs> hey. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Historical Commission public hearing and public meeting on Wednesday, April 20th, 2022. My name is Jane Wald and as chair of the Amherst Historical Commission, I'm calling this meeting to order at uh, 6.38 p.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting is being conducted by remote means. As no in-person attendance is permitted, every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In addition, uh, this, me this meeting is being recorded. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by opening the town's homepage on an internet browser, navigate to the town calendar at the bottom of that page, click uh, on the historical meeting historical commission meeting link, Zoom and telephone connections and the meeting agenda can be found there. So now we'll uh, take roll call attendance. Um, Patricia Auth. Present. Um, Catherine Davis is not present uh, and is not able to attend. Robin Fordham. Present. Becky Lockwood. Present. Janet Marquardt. Present. Teddy Startup is not present and unable to attend. And Jane Wald, I'm, I'm present. Wow. So from uh, members of the public, um, there will be opportunities for public comment um, during the public hearing and during the general public comment period. Um, if you wish to make a comment, um, please click the raise hand button uh, when uh, public comment is solicited. And if you've joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on the phone. Um, when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address, and then uh, put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the uh, discretion of the commission chair. So uh, moving on to the public hearing, uh, in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40A and Article 13, demolition delay of the Amherst zoning bylaw, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. The Amherst Historical Commission is holding this public hearing to provide an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the following application request. Uh, so First, 37 North Pleasant Street, um, parcel 14A49. Uh, the owner is Barry Roberts, who requests the full demolition of uh, a circa 1900 wood frame two story commercial building. Um, as you may know, the uh, previously issued demolition permit has expired. Um, so, this is a new demolition permit application. Uh, with um, a public hearing according to Article 13 of the zoning bylaw. So I will say that at the request of the applicant, the public hearing on this uh, demolition permit will be continued to May 18th at 6.35 p.m., which is the date of the uh, of Historical Commission's next meeting. Um, okay, so... Having done that, we'll go to um, the next demolition permit request. And this is for um, 285 Main Street, parcel 14B29, um, requested by owner Patrick Kamens for the full demolition of the rear detached garage, um, precise age un unknown. Um, this application, uh, and other historical information on the um, property in question is available at the Document Center on the town website. Uh, so the public hearing is now open um, and I'll take uh, just a couple of minutes to explain the goals and procedure for the public hearing. So I hope you'll bear with me for just a few minutes. Um, so section 13 of the Amherst uh, zoning bylaw governs 
uh, demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance. Uh, its policy is that the economic, cultural, and aesthetic standing of the town of Amherst can best be maintained and enhanced by due regard for the historical and architectural heritage of the town by striving to discourage the destruction of such cultural assets, the protection, enhancement, perpetuation, and use of structures of historical and architectural significance located within the town of Amherst is a public necessity and is required in the interest of the prosperity, civic pride, and general welfare of the people. Um, and under Massachusetts general laws and the town of Amherst zoning bylaw, it's the um, historical commission that's responsible for enacting the purposes and procedures of this policy. So what we'll do is um, uh, take any comments from the applicant, applicant in addition to um, the application itself and supporting materials uh, submitted with that, um, ask, uh, ben, for any in additional information that he may have, then we as a <laughs> commission will uh, have a chance to ask questions um, with uh, the applicant's response. Um, then there'll be a public comment period uh, and, um, and then we'll act on, the, uh, on, on a motion brought forward by a member of the historical commission. Um, so why don't we uh, proceed and ask Mr. Cammons to, um, if there's anything you would like to um, add to what you've uh, submitted with the application. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't need to add very much. I think it's pretty clear as to what we're looking to do. Our mind, uh, the group, that this is a building that was renovated a couple of years ago. We were unfortunate that, um, some students took it upon themselves to light fireworks on the inside of the building and pretty much leveled the entire building. And so on our behalf, the, the uh, <clears throat> restoration company came through, met with the person, got the permits and pretty much has built this to 2020 code. Um, so the last piece was after that was to take care of the exterior and there's like a retaining wall and then the paving and then there's the dilapidated garage in the back that really serves no purpose. We don't use it for parking. We don't use it for storage. There's, and it's not really readily visible from the street. So we're asking to remove it, to add parking, to make it easier for the students to park around the back. So there's less students cars on the front. And, um, you know, pretty much that's the last piece of the renovations for this property. Okay, thank you. Um, ben, do you have other comments or information? No, um, I don't have too much more to add. I wasn't um, really able to ascertain the age of the structure. Uh, you know, in the property card, I think it's listed at um, 1960, but then I've, you know, seen there does seem to be a structure there in some of the aerial imagery from, you know, previous earlier from 1960. So it's really hard to tell what um when this garage as we see it now was actually constructed um and you know definitely you know couldn't really find anything in terms of historical significance or importance to the uh property itself nor the um garage individually um, i'm happy just to while i have have them up just share a few pictures so everyone's on the same page what we're talking about um this is the garage in green here. Uh, Mr. Caymans was referring to the building uh, to the right um, next to it. And just bear with me here a little bit. I think there should be a few other pictures. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, just in terms of the condition. Um, yeah, and there's a one picture. Yeah, this is really what you see from the street. So. You can see it a little bit um, peeking out from the back. You know, this is um, certainly zoomed in a little bit. Um, so you might not, it might not really appear that big per se, but um, that's how it would look from the sidewalk, what you would see. And does everyone know where in town we're talking about? Um, okay. 
Okay. Okay, thank you, um, Ben. Um, so members of the commission, do you have questions or comments that you would like to make? Jan. Um, I was looking on the packet and I didn't see the actual application. It's not terribly important in this case, but I don't think Ben the application itself is there, just the photos and the map, right? Yeah, I guess um, that's a good point, actually, since we've moved into uh, the op open gov, this online permitting system, uh, there's no longer like a, uh, a paper application um, submitted. Okay. Um, but that's a good point, actually, I think. So they did submit an application through the online system. Um, in the past, I think I've downloaded the um, online application and, and as a PDF and put it in the um, packet, but I don't. Uh, I guess I, I didn't do that for this one. Apologize. It would be nice to have from now on. Yeah. Yeah. Even just for the, you know, for the record too. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, Pat or Becky or Robin, anything that you'd like to know? Anything additional? I don't think so. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Okay, um, then let us um, see if there's any uh, public comment. So seeing, uh, seeing no hands, um, let's see, I think we can then go to um, a review of the standards or simply a motion. Okay, I suggest we don't need to go through all those questions. I just move that we allow demolition of this building. I second. <clears throat> okay. I would just, I would just, word, I would just word it as if, um, you know, that the building is found to be not significant and therefore um, demolition can proceed. I move that we think that we have found the building to be not significant. I don't know. We haven't talked about it, but I'm assuming that everybody, that's what they're feeling. Um, and that we permit demolition. I oh. second. Okay. All in favor of the motion. We take yeah. Roll call vote? Yeah. Let's take a roll call vote. Sorry. Um, okay, so let's see, um, Becky Lockwood, Be Becky, yeah, sorry. Speaker. In favor. Thank you. Um, Robin Fordham. Uh, aye. Uh, Janet Marquardt. Yes. Um, Patricia Ah. Oh. In favor, yes. And Jane Wald in favor. Okay, so it is um, unanimous and um, uh, let's see, Ben, you'll follow up with next steps? Yeah, I will. So um, because this uh, garage is in the local historic district as well. Um, so Mr. Caymans will be coming to the local historic district commission on May 9th uh, for their approval for the demolition. Um, but as far as the historical commission is concerned, um, you're you, uh, this demolition can proceed and then I'll, I'll make that note in the open gov system and it's one step closer to getting your permit. So thanks for, thanks for coming today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. And thank everybody else. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye -bye. Uh, so at this time, um, I'm going to be absent for okay. a little bit and uh, I'll be joining you probably again around maybe around 7 30. Okay, so, okay. Thank you, Jan. Yep, got this. Got it. Okay, getting back to the agenda. I can find it. I had it up. I think it got lost. Nope. Um, I can bring it up as well. Um, I pulled up too many um, documents and now it won't. I can do it from the email again though. Here we go. 
Oh, okay, great. Okay, so the other one is continued. So we're now finished with the um, public hearings. Um, exactly. I need to have someone move that we close the public hearings. Yes. Mm, actually, do we close the public uh, hearings? We don't want to. I guess we can close the uh, 285 one, but we want to keep the well, 37. Well, we're continuing it, but for this meeting, we're no longer in public hearing. We're going to public meeting. So usually that requires agreement from the commission. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, I guess you can make a motion to continue the 37 North Pleasant Street hearing, but to close the 285 yeah. Main Street and move on to the public meeting portion. Somebody want to say so moved? So I'm so moved. <laughs> Great. Anybody okay. want to second? I'll second. Everyone in favor? I think we can do this with a hand vote. Yeah. yeah. Aye. Aye. Okay. Great. Okay. So now we're on to the bylaw. And the suggestions from the staff based upon recent review mm. by various committees around town. Okay. And let's see, get out of full screen here. So if you all have it, or Ben, you could pull up, I think just the staff recommendations. If you want to refer to the whole thing, perhaps you all can open it from the document. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, there we go. Okay, here's what we put together. Um, so I can provide just a bit of background about where we are in the process. If that's helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the exact dates in front of me, but I think it was uh, towards the end of February that we uh, present first referred to or presented to the full town council. That's like step one. Uh, the full town council, you know, heard a short presentation on the preservation bylaw, and then they uh, refer the bylaw to their subcommittees. Uh, the subcommittee, first subcommittee is the CRC, is the Community Resources Committee. Um, this, the subcommittees then hold a series of public hearings to kind of hear public input on the bylaw for the uh, subcommittee members to deliberate and discuss. And then ultimately they develop a recommendation um, to then send on to the full town council for their approval. Um, so where we are now is that the CRC held their first uh, public hearing last week. Um, there were some suggested changes. There was question. There were some questions, um, and and then they're kind of they knew the commission historical commission was meeting today on April 20th so they held their public hearing open knowing that you know we, we were going to discuss the bylaw um, and then wanting to resume their public hearing I think May 4th or 5th um, and so they'll take whatever comes from this meeting and uh, you know they might they could vote they might actually vote on the recommendation um, at that May meeting, it could take another meeting, but I think um, they're definitely eager to hear yeah. what the commission thinks. So, um, okay, thank you, Ben. So the staff has made five, has gone over five points and made four recommendations. One of them is to stay, to leave it without a change, but maybe we can go one through five and just- yeah. And I'd say too, I think the what this memo I put together um, reflects like conversations I've had with uh, my colleagues, the build, you know, the building commissioner, the planning director, uh, Nate. Right, um, these are not new. We've seen these before. Yeah, and I think the the CRC. I didn't share this memo with the CRC. You know, it's in our packet now, so they might see it at their next meeting. Mm -hmm. But I think some of these concerns are, you know, were. Are, arose independently of what staff thinks kind of were, were brought up by CRC members as well. Um, and I should say too, I think just stepping back, like the bylaws draft is very much improved altogether. I think I, we really like this, um, the two-step process for determining significance, the, the, this new like permitting process where we have an authorization and a preservation order. I think that's a big improvement. Um, I think there's just some concern about um, some of the finer details of like how 
demolition is defined and, and what that means for potential increase in, in our workload. And we're not looking for more work, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> but um, no, I think, I think obviously we don't wanna, we wanna preserve the intent of the bylaw, but just kind of recommend, we recommended some tweaks to, I think make it operate better, so. Um, Okay, um, so I assume everyone's read the first introductory page. Is everybody comfortable with that? Do we need to go over it? I don't, I'm not seeing a response. Does anybody need to go over that first page? No? No. 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 Okay, great. So let's move to the recommendations then. So the first one is something that we've talked about since we began this process in 2015. Um, it has certainly um, spilled a lot of ink in terms of discussion. And um, I guess I was one of the biggest proponents that we keep it at 50, so, you know, whatever. Now, uh, the suggestion is 75. There's, we've, you know, there's been 50, 70, and 75. Um, and different towns have different numbers. Um, how do people feel about the recommendation to increase it to 75 and use the preservation plan to identify the buildings between 50 and 75 in order to um, just pick out a few that are particularly evocative of that era um, in town and not worry about every one of them that has worked on to it, I guess, is the plan. Right, Ben? Yeah, yeah, I think um, I was just thinking about like, we have a process coming up with the preservation plan where we hopefully will, you know, work very closely with smart people at PVPC to help us better understand our historic resources in town. And, you know, the demolition delay or preservation bylaw is just one tool in our toolkit for preservation um but it's also the the kind of the, the most active one that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, receiving applications reviewing them and so i just i guess for me and for you know looking at our work in town hall i want to make sure that we're spending our time you know reviewing and looking at the demolitions of the most you know significant properties in town um mm -hmm. and, and I just, I guess my sense is there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of towns, I would venture to guess the majority of houses in Amherst are over reaching, approaching that 50 year threshold. And just what does that mean for, you know, especially if we're defining de demolition as 25% or more of a, of a facade, I think it could just open up the floodgates to a lot of applications that, you know, again, not all of them will reach the commission, but even just to review them for significance. You know, I wanna make sure I do a good job and then thorough and I'm not just uh, letting them, you know, rubber stamping or whatever. So um, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, I guess I, I just would recommend, I was recommending, you know, seven, we were recommending 75 years as just a way to um, cut down on the number of applications reviewed and the and really just focusing our efforts on ones uh, that are, I guess in this case, it would be pre-1947. Um, yeah, anyone have specific comments about that? Jan, would you just speak a little bit to your preference for 50 years? Um, I mean, yeah. I, I, think I'm, I think I'm more in line with you, but I also hear what Ben's saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate um, what Ben's saying, and I understand um, the staff as well as the commission time is um, precious. However, I have a couple of points I could make. One is that in a way, this is just kicking the can down the road because there is a huge number of, there are a huge number of housing estates filled with houses from the 50s and 60s that are sooner or later, you can't just keep pushing that date. Yeah. You know, to 100 and then 125. I mean, these are, many of them are now classic mid-modern homes. Many of them are not, and many of them already been um, modified. But it, it, I think 
I would be willing to agree with what you're saying if we put a caveat on it. One is that we write a definition of what we mean by highly significant for mid-modern, because I think a lot of people discount them oh. as uh, cheap tract homes, and a lot of them are not, they're custom. And the other is that we, we figure out how the preservation plan is exactly going to do this, because it's nice to say we're going to do something, but I've been on the commission too long to know that things don't just happen, um, or they might get started and they're never completed, right? And it has to do with our time as volunteers, staff time pulled in many directions. So I think that would somehow need to be in there. And then... Um, there needs to be some sort of public awareness program, whether we do it through the newspaper or letters to homeowners or whatever that lets people know that we are concerned and do take this seriously and that you might own a home that was built in 1960 and believe it or not, it's now considered historic, you know? Um, or 65 or whatever. It could be even from the 70s if it's a classic of a type. Um, people need to start thinking this way because I think people think Victorian, 19th century, maybe some colonial, and that's all that's historic. So. Yeah, I would. I that's where I really agree with you, Jan. Is the sense that it's um, it, it makes me nervous because it feel it feels like it's trying to fix fix a point in time where where um, historic resources are significant. And it, um, it really does have that sense of trying to pull the preservation into the mid-century modern era. And um, so I, I share your concern and I appreciate your comments. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I agree, Jan, with you and Robin. Um, I, I think if we, change the threshold to 75 years, we're going to lose the ability to, to um, evaluate requests to change house, homes that were built um, 50 years ago. And, and, and there, are, there are many examples, as you said, custom made, you know, um, that are an example of a particular period of time in the architecture. And we might we might not weigh in in terms of opposing demolition or changes, but at least I think it, it, that ought to come to the commission. I'm not saying that we shouldn't increase the threshold because I think in terms of the workload, it's a valid request. Yes. I'm just yeah. saying that we need to know how to use this preservation plan to identify and make it clear as well to homeowners that this is a this is an issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely opposed to changing it to 75 years, but we also have as part of this um, uh, revision of the, 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 the um, guidelines that there would be a small committee of uh, 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 together with the planning department that would weigh in on whether it should go to the historical commission. And that doesn't seem to add a lot of work um, to have that happen. Mm, okay, yeah, the, that actually is another recommendation further down, but. Um, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, I agree with you all about the age and the concerns, but I, I really, I think, I think that there are serious concerns about how to manage this. How's, how, how will this happen? Um, if we can figure out a way to manage it time-wise and leave it at 50, great. But if not, it may be that we have to at least phase it in and maybe down the road change it if the management can change. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, I mean, know. Yeah, I mean, one option could be that uh, um, the, the, the total demolition only applies to buildings 50 years or older, but then some of these more minor um, partial demolition projects or removal of features could only apply to buildings 75 years or older. It could be a way to... That's going to be really hard to parse, particularly as another recommendation is about that. Yeah. 
features. Mm, um, right. How do you see the preservation plan proceeding in terms of identifying significant examples of that era? Um, well, part of the preservation, part of the scope of work is to make recommendations to the inventory um, to, to both, it's to both uh, essentially in a way inventory the inventory, kind of give us a, a status mm -hmm. of the update on, on where we are with the macros updates, um, but also to highlight some er parts of town that are missing or some, you know, uh, era, you know, eras that are, you know, underrepresented in the inventory. Um, so yeah, I guess I was just imagining um, getting some clarity from the preservation plan about um, where um, both specific properties, but also generally kind of where there are gaps in, in the inventory and how, um, how to best mm. Carry and out, those yeah. recommendations would come from the PVPC, from us, from others. Where, where, where's um, the yeah, they will come from uh, PVPC as the consultant, yeah, working essentially for the planning department and for the commission. So they'll um, be working closely with because I mean, they don't know every property in town, right? There's a vast number of, homes. yeah, no, I mean, to, to really nail down, I like, I'm not, I don't think it's in the scope of work for. PVPC to actually be filling out the form B's and and submitting inventories. I think actually Shannon Wall, she's she's actually doing that right now for East Amherst. I think on a separate grant, but um, I think the the preservation plan will at least set the ground framework, I guess, for um, for to probably hire another consultant to to fill out the inventories. And actually, I mean, we do have some money remaining for, for inventory work. So if we could even work, do it in, in tangent um, potentially, but. Mm. I guess I would like to see the staff recommendation text include more specifics um, yeah. about how that would work and um, that it specifically identify mid-modern as a, you know, very um, prevalent style. <laughs> town I mean things like Echo Hill which wasn't that the first planned community in I don't know Massachusetts or it was the first like yeah like ecological you plan yeah community. I mean yeah. there, there's all sorts of things that um send up red flags in terms of what's important yeah I mean I guess I'm drawing the distinction between like there's in my mind there's just other tools and I don't I think it's I, I do agree that Echo Hill and you know some mid modern homes in Amherst are architecturally significant and and you know don't want to see them all vanish. But you know I I think I'm also just thinking practically too about like the the amount of building permits that come through town hall for all yeah, sorts right. of projects yeah. and yeah. no we get that that's yeah yeah and it's just I'm um, trying to find a balance I guess. I, I understand that and I'd say we just need more more information in the recommendation mm -hmm. um, I think before I'd be willing to vote on I mean maybe everybody else is happy with it as it is but um, and I think it should include something about public information about this issue so that because we've talked about people who have barns wanting to find a way to let people know that barns are significant and shouldn't be taken down and should be cared for and not, you know, demolition through neglect, is, you know, is something we're concerned about. And I mean, the same thing, same thing applies to these, these houses. People don't realize that they're becoming architecturally, you know, interesting, I guess would be the word, right? How's everybody feel? I, I think the idea of more clarity is is important if we were to consider the 75 years. And I think there's a, an addendum here about um, structures wouldn't be included in this, but somehow they have to be addressed. You think about the, the fences that we've addressed, you know, taken a look at in town. And um, well, that's a separate. That's a separate. Yeah, point. well, but there is, you know, that that fences and, and stone walls and gazebos, et cetera, 
wouldn't be, uh, they'd be excluded from structures. So that doesn't mean that we wouldn't take a look at them and, and, and weigh in on a decision, but, but you can't just remove them without having a, a category for them. Well, uh -huh. but we need to get to the second one to talk about okay. that. That's number two. Um, right. My only other comment is that, um, so even if we move to 75 years and, and use the preser preservation plan for the, the gap between 50 and 75 years, that also changes every year. So um, yeah. else it would be sort of a, you know, the scope of identifying buildings would be older than 50, you know, do it in five year increments or something so that, um, However, that would be addressed because otherwise every year uh, you might have buildings slipping by that are mm -hmm. they're not being recognized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there'd have to be something in place to regularly update the inventory right. you're saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, some, some communities use 50, some use 75 years, other communities use just pick a point in time like pre-World War II or pre-1900. Right. Either, either way, it's gonna yeah. move. And if we're gonna make a list, of ones that don't come under demolition delay, we need to have a method for yeah. today. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I would say I, I'd like to put that one on hold um, and maybe be, before their meeting, if everybody's comfortable with it, you could run language by us. If that's the only one, I mean, we need to look at the others. Um, and if we all agree, maybe, I don't know, I guess it's not a public meeting if we do a vote by email. Um, so we can't really do that, but. Yeah, well, let's see where we get with some of the other recommendations. Cause I think I kind of view this bylaw has all these levers that you can push and pull. I know, and, and they different all parts affect each other. Yeah. They all affect each other, so. Yeah. Um, Speaking of which, Pat brought up number two when we were talking about number one. It's a, it's yeah. a couple of that. Right, right. Uh, and this is, we, we have, we talked about this a quite a bit when we were writing it, and that's why we took the word structures out and put the word building everywhere. So I'm surprised even that this came up um, because we were, um, that we were very careful about that. Yeah, so we, oh wait, refresh my memory. I thought, sorry, maybe I worded this weirdly, but I, I, I'm, I'm proposing that we continue to um, review fences and stone walls and gazebos. Um, that that's how oh, the current... I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay. I would say I, I would. I, you're I, saying my... putting it back. Yeah, it's hard to read that way. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I saw it as being excluded, and and then where would we weigh in on it? So, I, I misread it, Ben. Yeah. So you I just, want to yeah. Put the word structures back in and to the definition. Yeah. Current in in, in, the, in the in the in the current bylaw proposal, oh. it, uh, it the um. There, I'll show you actually the. Yeah, we try to be really consistent all the way throughout too. So when you look at the definition of building, the word building shall include the word structure. And then if you go down to structure, it's any edifice, object, or building of any kind that is constructed or erected and requires more or less permanent location on the ground um, or mm -hmm. attachment to an object. So that would include your fences, stone walls, gazebos, that of the like. Mm -hmm. um, so what I, my, yeah, I guess I worded it weirdly. I meant to say, you know, if we did want to reduce the number of applications, we could exclude structures from the definition of building. However, I don't mm. think we actually get that many applications anyway. So I think it's fine to just keep that as is. Yeah, um, and a few times we have gotten fences and things. They really were significant. Yeah. Brick and, and iron and, you know, very historic. So, okay, yeah. so that takes care of that. Pat, are you happy with? I'm happy with that. I misread it. Um, yeah, yeah, I did too. I did so, too. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy with yeah. it. Thank you for clarifying, Ben. And as long as we're asking you for more detail on number one, maybe you could clarify that in the memo yeah. just when we're voting. We have the everybody's clear what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, for three, the de demolition part that talks about how much of it is considered demolition. Sorry, my cat is settling in against the monitor. Um, so 
this is something we've talked about ad nauseum, um, how much, whether it's a percentage, whether it's specific features, whether it includes more than the front. Um, and you're suggesting that these things should or should not be in. Again, it's a little hard to read what you mean when you say um, adding. So the proposed bylaw includes the definition of demolition. That's you know total, complete demolition, partial demolition, which is 25% or more of any one facade. And mm -hmm. then um, this part, part C, which is the removal or modification of important architectural features. Um, so obviously, currently the bylaw is really mo mostly focused on total demolition. We do look at some like, I would say major partial demolitions, which, you know, um, make, you know, large rear additions, for example, mm -hmm. that are being taken down. Um, so I guess my first point is I think even this 25% or more um, definition would add, um, you know, a good amount of work to a, a just application. It would apply to more projects. Um, because, you know, 25%, I, I think it's a, I, I, a lot of other communities use that. And I think it's a good way mm -hmm. to capture some major, you know, demolition projects. Um, my concern is mostly about the important architectural features, which is part C of the definition. Um, and really, you know, just thinking about the, you know, again, because we're, you know, if we're keeping the um, age of the threshold at 50 years, that suddenly, you know, I don't know, 80% of the homes in Amherst, anytime they are, you know, removing, a, you know, trim, windows, uh, siding, roofing, um, chimney work, that kind of stuff, it would at least get to my desk. Or first, it would have to be flagged by the permit administrator, which is, you know, added work for them. And then it would get to my desk to determine significance in, in conjunction with, you know, uh, the chairperson of the commission and just, um, wanting to be cautious just about the amount of uh, added work that could cause, and really, is it accomplishing the goals of um, that we're hoping to? Um, because it, yeah, it just seems like it would. There's maybe better tools for for really focusing on the the preservation of these finer details for some homes that that rise to that level. Um, because in a way, it's really it's you know turning the whole town into a local historic district in in some in in, in, in some respects. Um, so the way will, that you have it yeah. worded, I think, was confusing. Is it makes it sound like um, A is total, B is partial, and C is all. Um, it sounds like adding partial, and that is the twenty five percent. It's the same thing as what you just said above, or partial 25% or more. Um, so you're saying that you would leave, but you would take away just C, the um, Yeah, I'll go. Features. Yeah, so here are the three parts. So total yeah, destruction yeah. of entire building, obviously that makes sense. And, uh, any act of pulling down, destroying 25% of sure. any facade, I think that's fine. I think that'll be effective in capturing a lot um of projects and then it's it's really see that um and so i guess um again your your paragraph needs um needs explanation because you just say adding would add would add to the number of applications and then again adding this would add to the number of applications but you're not yeah. saying which one is okay and which one isn't you see what i mean okay yeah um yeah, so we have concerns specifically over part C, the, the um, important architectural features. Okay, so yeah. under recommendation, say part C, okay? Okay, yeah, I guess that's what we meant by important details, but yeah, no, I can clarify that. But the um, important architectural features are modified by being on the inventory, right? If we went back yeah. to that. So it's not, so, yeah. for every, every, yeah. it's not for every single building in town, it would be only for those that we identify as particularly significant. If that's yeah. the 
case, I would argue that the important architectural features are what, you know, I keep getting drilled into my head in class as they're, they're character defining. Mm -hmm. They're what, um, you know, they're, they're, they're essential elements to their historical integrity. So I'm, given that there's that modifier that we've already identified the building in the inventory as one that we have particular eyes on, I'd be uncomfortable with removing that since it's really linked to the very reason they're on that list to begin with. But there is a good point that we don't really have much teeth <coughs> with a delay, right? Which is part of what they're saying. Right. So the preservation plan, if we use it right, I'm just not sure, that's why I was asking for clarification the first, I'm not sure exactly how this preservation plan is gonna work to deter <laughs> these changes. Right, or taking down a 1960s house for that matter. Um, yeah, so obviously I, I kind of split apart recommendations three and four um, mm -hmm. because one is just in general, this idea of looking at important architectural features and then number four is more about the immersed inventory and kind of what that might look like. And, and yes, that could be used as a filter, but I just, I guess I just have concerns that if we're, because we've gone back and forth, the Amherst inventory might just be what's on Macris. But even so, I think Macris has 1,400 properties on it, mm -hmm. not all of which are significant, to be right. honest. You know, there's a lot of just, you know, homes that have been inventoried and no one's really taken a close look at whether they're actually historically significant or have architectural significance. So I guess also, I just that's not a tool. All that is is a resource. It doesn't actually create any kind of process by which anybody consults Macris or uses Macris yeah. to limit people's activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess my concern was like just putting the cart before the horse a little bit, like where we don't have an inverse inventory yet, but if we're using that as a modifier for this part C, and then I guess then I would just prefer to see the inventory developed first and then decide if part C is worth adding in. Or put it in and then it's worth taking out. It'd be easier to take it out later if we have the inventory to replace it and see how it goes. How many of those are we gonna get? I mean, I, I really think it's easier to start with too much and then lighten it than to go back and add more limitations. Um in terms of getting people to vote them in, you know? Unless you think it won't pass because of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was definitely a concern about um, at, at the CRC meeting about how this plays with the 75 to, and 50 year threshold, just, you know, yeah. looking at these two levers and just yeah. the amount of, of work uh, load. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like there could, like ultimately, you know, the CRC and the town council, they're the elected body and they, they get to make the final say, I guess, if you will. So they can always make changes right up to the last second and then, um, and then vote a final bylaw. Um, so the, I do think there was some concerns and there, you know, there's a, a good chance at least some, some of this could be modified or would be modified. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I think, um, I guess I just don't, I, I, I think the preservation plan would definitely, um, a strong focus of that work that the consultants doing for us will be looking at the, you know, inventory of historic buildings in town and also recommending other tools for how to mo more effectively preserve those structures. Um, and I they couldn't write something into the bylaw that says that, that something like this um, option could be, could eventually be removed once the preservation plan is written and um, implemented with you know, tools. Mm -hmm. like, put it right into the bylaw so that then it would be easy to go back and say, okay, we have a functioning preservation plan. We have a process by which it can help us keep things from being, you know, demolished or 
modified. So we're now going to, you know, strike, say, you know, section C. Um, mm -hmm. And it could literally still be on the books with a, you know, a vote to line right through it or something. Right. But it would still be there if we needed it. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, a question about that part. If it remains in the bylaw, is there an obligation then to carry out what it says? Yeah. Until we decided to remove it. So if we say that right. this could eventually be, then we would go back before all these bodies, however many you need to just modify a paragraph in a bylaw. Maybe it's not as many, I don't know. And say, okay, as we prepared for in the original writing, we're now at the point where this can be removed and we no longer will, you know, yeah. this. I understand that, but what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is if, if I have a house that was built in 1950 and I want to replace the windows, is this bylaw going to require me to go before the, uh, you know, the demolition process? Um, my understanding is right now you'd have to submit your application and then the staff and what the mm -hmm. one designated member would look and decide whether it needs to be reviewed by okay them. okay yeah right. thank you i just wanted to understand about how, how this will work if we leave it in as long as it looks just like the other windows or doesn't change the look of the house i don't think there'd be any problem if you had a number of those come up and they don't need the whole commission to make that decision is that your understanding, Ben? Um, yeah. So basically, um, any small change like that would first need to be they. You know, a building permit is required for that. So you'd submit a building, or your contractor would okay. submit a building permit, and then that would be flagged by someone in town hall, the permit administrator. It would be sent to my desk, and then I would do research into the property and see if it's historically significant or if the window change would, you know, is considered a removal of an important architectural feature um, and mm. either then decide to send it to the commission or then to just approve it. But again, you know, you multiply that by potentially, you know, five a week or something and it's, that's yeah. like potentially three or four hours of work right there. So yeah, that's, that's my concern. Mm -hmm. um, right. Hi. I am, am thinking as Jan is that we don't remove that now. It's easier to remove something if we find that it is it's not no longer necessary than it is to put back in. You know, it looks like it's a change that's that, that can't be explained simply to remove as opposed to returning. So I I I would like to see it uh, continue to be part of the plan. How do y'all feel about wording within the bylaw that says that this could be removed in the future? Do we need to word that in the bylaw, Jan? I don't know. It's just a thought. Well, I don't know that we say that it could be removed, but it, that it would be reviewed. Yeah, I'm future. just saying that to, to, to suggest that the preservation plan could replace the, the function with that whatever is going to go with the preservation plan as an actual function, whatever that's going to be, could replace this. And it could replace some other things too. But until it's up and running, we need to, you know, protect um, the buildings. And then if we say that this is something that may eventually replace it then we see that coming, but, but we haven't taken it out of the bylaw for the time being. Right, but I, 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 I would, for, if we say anything at all, I would say that this, this section will be reviewed uh, um, in the future. Because if we say we, this could be taken out in the future, it's, it's, a, it's a whole essay. Oh, oh yeah, explain I'm, why. I'm not giving exact wording. <laughs> um, I'm just suggesting that the preservation yeah. plan to be bulked up before we right right yeah. and i i'm of that mind because um the whole point is to preserve 
what is and be rational and reasonable about it. Um, and so if we start removing aspects of review, um, we, we've already put in uh, things into this new revision that will allow just one member of the historical commission and, and Ben or some of the planning department to review it and to see where, where it goes. Um, so I think we've, we've streamed, by doing that, we've already streamlined it a little bit. Well, that's the fifth point we have to still consider because that's not allowed apparently. So. Oh. oh. <laughs> so wait, wait, wait till we get there. Yeah. Okay, sorry um, about that. I keep jumping ahead. No, it's okay. I mean, the, it just goes to show you how interconnected all of this is, so. Yeah, it is. It's very Yikes. interconnected. Yeah, I mean, I guess, can I just pose a question? Like, in what circumstances would you actually get to the point of putting a dem demolition delay on someone replacing their windows or putting, you know, up new trim on like a, on a mid-century mm -hmm. you know, house? And I like, a... I guess... I just the amount of I guess I just the amount of time and effort it takes to get to that point potentially. I guess I'm just I don't know. I guess I'm just curious generally. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of buildings that are <clears throat> have like large plate windows that are yeah. then placed with double hung vinyl clad windows that are yeah. like smaller, so like a like a so Palladian like, window right, or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, just changing the shape, sometimes recutting the shape happens or, you know, cheap things that don't have the same kind of pains or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, it would have to be significant to matter, obviously. You know. I, ha I have a, a friend right now who lives in a um, old, that, that beautifully taken care of old, um, Oh, just what, what do we even call it a probably a Greek revival farmhouse um and they're uh looking at replacing their windows and the cost of good window replacement is exorbitant mm -hmm. and um you know I mean I talked to her I said you know I said if you take the old windows out stick them in the basement at least <laughs> because you know they they could be restored but it I mean it really got me thinking about like you know there really is this question of, of, you know, the difference between a district and, um, you know, these scattered houses all over the place. I mean, their house, because of the exceptional way that they take care of their house, it makes it, <laughs> if you looked at it, you'd say, oh yeah, that's actually pretty significant. I mean, they have the original or, you know, semi-original um, wood storms. And I mean, they're beautiful old windows and what they really need is CPA money to if they were to you know want yeah. to restore them and yeah. and then they would they could be made highly functional and and well insulated with mm -hmm. you know but it was like a thousand dollars a window um so it it, it is that would be considered a, a personal uh, um property and cpa money we're arguing about whether that can even go to it so. oh well i mean we've determined that it can't that's that's clear but yeah. i mean that, that it you know that the, that becomes this kind of proactive i mean would it would a demolition delay would, would a demolition hearing allow for us to let them know about this resource or well, is it that's just the too, whole point of the delay or or is it too onerous both for homeowners and staff to have this kind yeah. of overlay. and that yeah. you know I'm really kind of stuck between the two because I'm heartbroken that they're going to take these windows out and um at the same time you know what are what are the choices for a homeowner and and then you know Ben yeah. makes a really good point about just the volume across town I mean mm -hmm. It really is more, you know, I mean, in that, in that case, I would think we should just work towards, you know, having an outbuilding and, you know, window restoration and something like that, you know, fund or promotion of CPA funds for that purpose, if that's what we want to see happen. Um, is, is there another way to protect these architectural features? I don't know enough about this to know. So that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's a limited number of tools in our arsenal, if you will. Um, the demo, this bylaw is one of them, but the 
again, that can only be a delay of one year. I think uh, if there are a cluster of homes, and actually that's not true, there can be a single building local historic district. Mm -hmm. So local historic district is, you know, I guess, you know, like the Dickinson Museum is in a local historic district. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole different commission, the local historic district commission right. that reviews right. in excruciating detail every exterior architectural change to um, homes that are in the local historic district. So you can put a local historic district around one building, for example, like the Conkey House, for example, or a cluster of buildings mm -hmm. like what we have in the Lincoln Sunset neighborhood. And then every architectural change made to those buildings would be reviewed and, and need approval of the local historic district commission. Um, so again, I mean, that, that was my suggestion rather than casting this net town wide and reviewing every architectural change on the entire town That's really what I'm thinking. be more mm -hmm. to be more proactive and, mm -hmm. and identify which properties are really we don't want to see lose those architectural details and, and put those in a local historic district. Because um, I think we already have the infrastructure set up for that with the local historic district commission. Right. Um, and well, again, they, they, they can completely outright reject the, the, someone removing their architectural features if they were to strip a house of historic windows or it's not just a one year right. delay, it's- But the it's, commission, the, the, the local district has to be approved by the council, right? Yep, yeah, you can't just snap your fingers yes. yeah, and get a local yeah. historic district. Right. Right. Yes, it's, right, it's, right. Well, exactly. it's not a, the historic commission, so it, and it, yeah. it takes a lot of work. So, yeah. you know, on the one hand, you've got a demolition delay that maybe doesn't stop anything, but, you know, gives you a chance for a conversation, whereas the local historic district takes a lot of effort to, uh, to kind of get the impetus behind actually seeing that one is valid and then going through the process and getting yeah, it approved. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're different kind of tools, but I mean, you know, I think, you know, like in the, the case of my friend's house, you know, you don't really see the having I mean, you do, you see it from the road when you drive by, but you know, is that, is that enough, you know, to put that burden on, on, on the town staff and on, on homeowners across town to, and then that also raises yes. the question of how would the preservation plan provide another tool that could be used? <coughs> there's no, there's no clear way that that's going to actually contribute to, to this solution, right? Um, well, I think that's the focus of the preservation plan is really, uh, kind of invent or you know looking backwards at what you know all the efforts of preservation efforts to date and then kind of uh looking at where we're at now and where we need to go and providing uh tools and recommendations and you know projects and implementation guidelines for really how we can um you know improve preservation efforts in town so but it's all still pie in the sky is what i'm saying it's not there yet so that's why i guess we've all been saying all these things sound good, but none of them can replace section C yet. Right? Yeah, I just don't think part C is um, without the Amherst inventory in place, it's hard to know. I don't really understand what part C is, I guess. And um, yeah, right. Because it, I mean, ultimately, I think reading i'm gonna to go to the bylaw for a second um when you look at how this is worded for buildings listed on the amherst inventory of historic buildings accepted by vote of the commission and updated periodically i think part c actually wouldn't come into effect until there is an amherst inventory that's accepted by a vote of the commission right and that's um, the tool. that's what i'm saying is the inventory doesn't provide the tool the bylaw provides the tool how to use the inventory. It's the other yeah. way around. And this is where the inventory has teeth. Otherwise, it just sits there. It's like backrest. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, I guess I just, I, my, my, um, my concern is that the inventory grows to, you know, thousands of properties or something. Well, but it doesn't have to. It, it doesn't have to, to. Like, yeah. Becky, doesn't... your house isn't on it, so you wouldn't have to worry about your windows. Right. Unless right. it's 
unless it's going to be the 75 year thing but even then it's not listed on the inventory so the yeah. partial features the architectural features aren't part of that concern mm -hmm. so okay so i just want to make sure i understand this because this is different when i read part c if i've got a house that's 80 years old okay and i'm going to replace the windows and and maybe a back porch that's rotten and for some reason, it's not on the inventory. Does this not apply to me then? Is that what no. you're saying? Yeah, not for the modifying of the architectural okay. elements. Okay, okay. That's, I didn't, thank you. Yeah. That's helpful. And that's why I think, personally, I think it's needed in order to make the inventory function. So, Jane, did you want to take that? That over? makes sense. Uh... Yeah. Well, um, We're, why don't I why don't I do that after we finish this item? Because I uh, I don't want to I, I don't want to undo something that <laughs> you all have have already covered. I don't know. We've totally balled it up so much that you can't get back to it. Um, right. We're on number five of the recommendations now. So let's okay. talk about those, and then maybe we can figure out what exactly we want to do. So the last one. Can I is the problem with having the two people make this determination, both staff and commission member. Um, hey, do you mind? I, I'm sorry, I just said I didn't want to, but I would like to actually make a comment on, um, on this last one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if there is no Amherst inventory right now of historic buildings, we've got a couple of, we've got, at least three ways that I can think of to, to start one, uh, it, it, uh, according to the provision of section C where we, where we approve it and update it periodically. Mm -hmm. So we could uh, go to Macris and select, you know, 200 buildings or, you know, 500 buildings that we are certain where we are certain that um, they are identified correctly in macros. Um, there's also a list at the back of the original preservation plan. And then third is um, the work that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is going to be doing on a new on an updated plan. Right. Um, but you know, if we wanted to make a start we wouldn't have to have an entire inventory. We could have a reasonable inventory that would make part mm -hmm. C implementable. So, so that we wouldn't, I mean, I, I guess I'm a little uncertain that a gradual, that approval, that, that gradual approval of different pieces of a bylaw is the you know the best way to go i mean in a way i'd rather have an in inventory to start with so that we can activate the mechanism and see how it functions yeah well what we've been talking about is that there is no activation yet and we don't exactly know how it's going to work um and so we were just being cautious about taking something out of the bylaw right because the proposal is basically to remove that whole section C before we know what's going to replace that or what's, how that's gonna work, you know, to actually um, say, take away the whole question of architectural features. But if, if we were to do an inventory and, and Jane, your suggestions about how to organize that in, in an immediate way um, are well said, then, we, we, I don't know whether you were here as part of the discussion, but part C actually gives us, if there is an inventory, gives, gives us an opportunity to act on those properties um, specifically. So um, maybe at another meeting, we need to talk about how we can implement um, organizing the inventory. And, and I think that could be done through our committee. I think it could be done through CPA money to hire someone to do that, to review the macros 
um, and, and, and select those properties that are most historic. Um, and that's, that's for another discussion, but I, I'm, I'm opposed to removing C right now. So that's where we stand at the moment. Huh? Um, okay. So let's talk about five and then um, all of them are sort of hanging in the balance at the moment since they're all interconnected and then maybe we'll decide where we want to come down. Is everybody good with that? Yep. Yeah. So the this is a little more straightforward yep. because it's of the legal problem. Yeah. Do you want me to explain this one for folks? Uh, Please. I haven't read it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, one of the big ideas with this bylaw proposal was to have um, a smaller group, whether it's you know staff and a commission member, two commission members, some smaller group make this determination of significance. They'd be authorized by the commission to do that. Um, in talking with our town's attorney, we've determined that the, or he confirmed that um, this group, this, this group of designees would be uh, considered a subcommittee of the historical commission and would there, therefore be subject to open meeting law, which means they would have to, you know, post their meeting, you know, uh, take minutes, um, it would be open to the public. And so the whole idea was to be able to kind of make a quick determination of significance and not need to convene the commission. Uh -huh. uh, and in this case, it would be, it wouldn't be convening the full commission, but it would be convening, um, you know, at least one other member potentially. Um, so, and, and it would require 48 hours notice. It would kind of, you know, there's just steps to take that, you know, to post it in the town's calendar. It all, it seems simple, but it, you know, it becomes complicated and um, with open meeting law. So that was a surprise and definitely kind of put a wrench in, in some of our plans. Cause again, cause it, if this is to be a subcommittee, then these, what I'm still going to call a, 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 a lot of more applications that are coming through the pipeline um, are now required to convene a meeting uh, posted on the town's calendar. And um, as opposed to just, you know, someone like myself or the chair of the commission, just quickly researching it and, and making a determination. So it kind of just it exacerbates some of the other issues. Um, that increase the workload. So our recommendation was that the authority to make this determination of significance is really vested in either one staff person or one commission member. But it, uh, the town's attorney said it's okay for that designee to then consult with other people, um, one other person to make the determination. Um, but ultimately, if it's if it's the that one individual who has the authority to make the decision rather than a group who has the authority to make the decision, it's okay for the, for that person to, um, to, to not need to hold the public meeting for them to make that decision. So, but again, I think that creates some issues because I, I liked the idea of it being a group of staff and commission members um, rather than just really vesting that power into one person. Um, and I know folks on the CRC and the planning board also appreciated having more collaboration. So yeah, it's just, again, we, this news came to us just like early last week. So we're still kind of like scratching our heads, like, oh geez, um, wrapping our heads around what, it, what it, the implications are. But um, yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> It occurred to me that perhaps one could set up a standing meeting uh, at a regular interval that's always, uh, that's known, you know, publicly announced. There will be every two weeks at this time on this day, this meeting between these two people. And then the minutes are literally like one, each one, this, this place, this address, sort of like the note, like police notices, this address, 
was not sent for review. This address was sent for review, blah, blah, blah. And that's it. Because we have to mm -hmm. make a record anyway of each one. And it's open to the public, but I mean, if somebody has, you know, skin in the game, I mean, because it's their place or something, yeah, they could possibly ask that they could be included in that meeting. But it's if it's always set up, then you wouldn't have to be going through this 48 hour or whatever it is, you know, notification or anything. Would that work? You still have to do the 48 hour notice and the posting and all. I mean, I, I, having been on, on the staff side of that, it, Still, it's still a lot of work. But I mean, it would just always be the case. It would always no, be. No, I understand. But you wouldn't have to do a 48 hour thing, you know? Well, like, you, you, you'd still have to post it. I mean, you still have to yeah. give notice, for, you know, regardless. You know, meetings happen every month in Greenfield, but you always had to, you know, post the notice for them. That's just part of the mm. process. Mm. So it doesn't really eliminate that. That aspect of it. it would just roll over automatically. Yeah, I mean, it definitely it would make the scheduling easier just to know right. that it's we're yeah. going to have that. Where is yeah. it published? It's published in the paper and online, right? Yeah, I guess this is a public meeting, so it would really just be in the town's calendar. Yeah, so that would just be, you know, whoever does the calendar would know that always on these days, this time, that needs to be put in, you know. I don't know. I just thought that would maybe make it easier because I'm not comfortable with either one staff member or one commission member making all the decisions either. I think that's yeah. not, it's onerous and it also places but so much responsibility that, you know, a person would end up getting a lot of heat if they if something came up. Yeah. Well, I consulted with the others and then people say, oh, but she break, broke the open meeting law or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I did, add like a I, I did also suggest a provision that the designee could request that the full commission take on the responsibility of making that determination if it's That's a what we've been doing all along. Yeah, but for I think if there's projects where the designee is uncomfortable making the decision, then um, they could kick it on to the kick it back to the full commission to yeah, well, that was agreed to, you know, anytime somebody felt like they either the two people didn't agree or there was a like yeah. you wanted the other members, but it doesn't really protect whoever it is from something they thought was no problem. And it comes yeah. back around later that neighbors go ballistic, you know. So anyway, anybody, anybody else? At the um at the CRC meeting. Uh my and at the planning board meeting also, um my impression was that both bodies um, really preferred to have more people involved. And I, uh, so I don't, I don't know that this yeah. would, that this, that the council would approve this particular proposal. Um, uh, but, you know, if we can't do something like this, then we're kind of back where we started with uh, our current our current procedures. Mm -hmm. um, I think if if we tried to if we tried this approach, um, I suppose the designee should be the chair to address the kind of citizen input piece of this. Um, on the other hand, well here, tell me if this would work then. If the designee is the staff person and the staff person consults with the chair or another member of the commission, because it's a staff person, could that person also consult individually with another member of the commission? Yeah, I was thinking that some of this parsing of what's staff and what's commission and therefore what's public meeting, it's really vague. Yeah, I think, um... So like almost a game of telephone to <laughs> kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> that there would not like the staff person would be the point would uh, be the hub and it, like I wouldn't know what Jan had told you and uh, Jan would know what Becky told you <laughs> <laughs> poor Ben. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, being pulled, pulled all, all different ways. Um, yeah, I mean, I think because uh, uh, there are sometimes instances where I'll email out, you know, do, does this require a public hearing? And then I say, don't respond, don't reply all and just right. let me know. Um, so it's not like a deliberation. So I guess something like that could work. Um, but again, I guess yeah. I, I just caution, you know, we're talking without any of the changes recommended, like, I think like, you know, three, four, five, maybe more applications per week, just for all these things. So it's like, you know, the idea was to be just be able to make quicker decisions for the really straightforward ones and then um, convene a, a group as needed, I think, for maybe more complicated projects. Mm -hmm. um, but even just making the quick decisions, I think I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to be able to do um, my homework and look into these and, and make sure it's, I'm not missing something. So um, I guess they're not as quick as I might make them out to be, but. <laughs> Well, I mean, it could be both. We could say, okay, the staff member consulting with individual commission members as needed. And then if it doesn't work out, maybe we could try the thing of the regular meeting, you know, where we do have a designated commission member. I don't know. Okay. It, um, so the Will this ultimately be decided by the council? Um, yeah, I think the CRC will probably make uh, recommendations at their next meeting or the one after that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the town council will, you know, would likely vote on the version that the CRC recommends and then they can always make amendments to the bylaw at their final meeting. Okay. But I think, yeah, I feel like something like this last section is, uh, it would be good to iron out because I don't know if the CRC, they, they're not as involved in the mechanics of like the bylaw. And so they'd probably look to the commission to figure out what they think makes sense. Um, well, I think, you know, I, I, I sort of think our position should be, um, what is most functional? Yeah, I mean, because a lot of this bylaw rewrite is 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 to create efficiency, mm -hmm. um, and we can we can you know our position can be uh, something like this because it is most efficient and most functional, and then if there's you know, significant concern about that, then that has yeah. to be proposed to us, I guess. So okay. you're saying that you would go ahead with the recommendation as listed there um, and let, if they don't think it will work, let them come up with an alternative. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, Ben is right that this, this news is all brand new so there's hasn't there hasn't been a lot of time to think about alternatives and um there may be other there may be other committees and commissions that have to deal with something similar and it hasn't mm -hmm. gotten to them yet so that you know if they have a if if, the, if somebody's going to have a better idea we don't have the quite the benefit of um just copying them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Quite yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, Ben change the wording uh, on the second line where it says to encourage the designee to consult with the other person. Maybe instead of that and the parenth parenthetical phrase after it to say to consult with the commission members as needed, individual commission members as needed. Mm -hmm. Does that make it clearer, maybe? Yeah. So. And that way we are stating, I mean, I think everybody pretty much agrees that the staff member should be the one who's the hub, right? Not a member of the commission? Or does anybody 
have an issue with that. I think if it's a member of the, well, this is sort of a two part thing. Um, oh yeah, if it's a member of the commission, we consult with another member, then we're getting into the open meeting issue. Yeah, got it, okay. Yeah, I guess I, I, in other towns, I think in Northampton, for example, they real they their bylaw they have the option they can do all three. Essentially, they can determine significance at the public hearing. They can do it as a subcommittee at a public meeting, um, or they can designate authority to one person to make that determination. Um, oh, and so they, but I think in talking to Sarah, my. Uh, colleague over there she she said that they almost always just do it at a public hearing because they one they don't get as many applications because they're they have a narrower scope and two they just know that there's there would be they would get flack if they weren't doing it in a public um forum so um again i think because we have more applications coming a public hearing wouldn't be practical even um, a public meeting. Yeah, public meeting would be, you know, almost meeting every other week or something. So. Um, okay, well, is everybody comfortable with five if it's rewritten that way? I think if it's rewritten that way and if, and if it's a, a legally appropriate, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Hey, we got one, Ben. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Jane, just to bring you up to date on number one, um, changing the threshold from 50 to 75, um, we talked about it a long time and we'd like more information in the recommendation, more uh, specific steps to take that would help the preservation plan function. Um, to ensure preservation. So I can't even remember what the points were anymore. It was um, to um, make sure that there's public information that goes out that lets people know that their, mm -hmm. their, the age of their house is at or over the threshold, that um, we come up with some sort of significant fires of what is significant about mid-modern architecture so that we can start to identify them with some definitions rather than just higgledy-piggledy. Um, we talked about the fact, or at least I talked about the fact and everybody agreed that this is pushing, this is just gonna keep pushing. If every time you change it to a longer time, it, it's gonna just keep pushing the problem forward. Um, and that at some point you can't just go to 125, 150, 175, we need to draw a line. Um, anyway, we asked Ben to put more information into how the recommendation would actually function, I guess. I'm trying to remember, it was a half an hour ago and I'm completely blank. And, and was there uh, agreement to increase the age threshold or, uh, Only or is that? Pending. It's pending seeing exactly how this would work, how the preservation plan would ensure preservation. <laughs> because it's kind of vague, you know, using that process, what is the process and how would it help ensure their preservation? That's what's unclear. I think the preservation plan would recommend tools to implement to accomplish those goals. I guess um, we need to see that before we could approve the recommendation. We did agree on number two though. So actually we only have three outstanding at this point and number yeah. three and four are linked. So we're not doing too badly. <laughs> um, and then three and four was what, you know, what, when you came in talking about section C and um, how the Amherst inventory could mm -hmm. help deal with these important architectural features. And again, it was unclear exactly how we're going to get that inventory up and running and how it's going to become a tool. Okay, so thank you. Um, the, the only thing I'll say about 
number one, the age threshold is um, nearly everyone who spoke at the CRC meeting uh, was concerned about that. Um, and I think this bylaw is likely to go to the council for action before the preservation plan is in, is in place. So the people who spoke, you're saying like public comment, people, homeowners who had houses that are that old or the people who were members of the CRC? Members of the, of the CRC. Okay. And um, so I did discuss the, the mid-century architecture piece and sort of brought on um, an example of buildings at UMass, which of course we wouldn't review anyway, but um, uh, but you know when push comes to shove about the fifty-year threshold, and I I looked this up recently in historic preservation literature, and um, maybe maybe Robin you have more information about this. Um, basically, it is historic preservation tradition it's 50 just years. yeah 50 years it, it, yeah, it's, yeah and it's not unfortunately there's not a whole lot of underpinning specific rationale underpinning for the 50 years well there are towns that have gone to 75 because we've been talking about this for seven years and we've looked at the list of those that had yes um, Mm -hmm. But I'm, I still think we're kicking the can down the road because, you know, it's right. just going to keep, eventually we're going to pick up this building boom in Amherst um, with the houses that come under the designation of mid-modern. And they aren't all tract homes. There are significant ones. And if we could put them into a list, <laughs> as you were, you know, mentioning, mm -hmm. then then that could become a tool. But at the moment, it's not a tool. It's an idea. And I just have had too much experience on the commission to see this actually happening quickly and being useful. You know what? I, I, I um, and Ben is aware of this. Um, we had a conversation about North Pleasant Street um, months back and how m many of those buildings, homes, um, are historically significant. And so Hetty and I were appointed a subcommittee, which we just found out th that we were unnecessary because of the, the Sunset, um, Lincoln, um, South Whitney um, local historic commission. district. Yeah, commission, thank you. And, and, and so, but, but what I did was to inventory all of the homes along North Pleasant Street right. from CBS to um, the end of Kendra Park. And so, and most of those homes have a name. They have a architecture listed, a macros. I pulled macros and I pulled the assessor's cards. And so, that would be a place to, I mean, that's an easy place to start in terms of inventorying historic buildings. Except and those the, are older than 50 years. Excuse me? Those are older than 50 years, though. Those they're, older than, they're older than 50 years. They're, they're, they, they go back to um, the late you know, 1700s, 1800s. Um, all right. pre What I'm saying is they, they don't, that's not the concern. Those are going to be covered anyway. The concern is with things that were built in the 60s and 70s. So the, I understand the, what you're saying, Jan, but you know what? It, we, I'm, I'm reverting back to the idea of an inventory. Uh -huh. They're on Macris, but they're not on, a, they're not on an Amherst inventory. Right. And, and, and Ben was very kind after I got all of this and I had trouble um, transmitting it digitally to copy all of my hard copy because I downloaded it. And so, so you know, that, that in and of itself um, would be a, a core to an Amherst inventory. And 
I know that that local historic district did some of the houses on the side streets mm-hmm. and they're working on that now. And so, so you know, and, and I, I would imagine that the Dickens, Dickinson, whatever that historic district is called, I would imagine that there are macros um, form Bs on those properties. And so if, if those were all to be pulled, um, that could be the beginning of, of the Amherst inventory that, that would go back to Part C or whatever we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Well, isn't that in that list that's attached to the preservation plan? I, I don't know, Jan. I, I, I didn't start with that. I, I just, when, when, when I offered to assist the um, Sunset Lincoln South Whitney uh, um, local historic district, I decided that the best way to do that was to go on Macris and to go on the uh-huh. assessors the assessors card for all of those properties on on, on North Pleasant, and and so I would imagine that we could do that for the Dickinson, we could do that for East Amherst, we could do that for for the Lincoln Sunset South Whitney and and immediately have it, an inventory. And, and um, hey, Rob, yeah. has been trying to say something. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just gonna try to um, see if I could summarize what I think is the issue here, which is that we have this, uh, that that essentially moving to a 75 year threshold is a way of managing volume. Um, And that we do have, I'm thinking of, uh, um, Jan mentioned Echo Hill, there's the the neighborhoods on East Pleasant Street, um, you know, the small um, branch communities out there and you've got Orchard Hill, I think that's another big one. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is this is the concern, and uh, obviously those that so we have this volume of of properties that are historic, but aren't necessarily significant. Like that's that's the issue, and how we develop this process to not overwhelm both the commission and the town. So um, well said. Yeah, so, and then the other piece of this is that we have a preservation consultant who presumably could be advising us on, is gonna be advising us on on how to best develop our inventory. So that'll be, we'll get the direction from them. Um, And so I'm still stuck on this 50 to 75 years because I agree with, with, Jane, that 50 years seems to be the historic preservation standard. Um, but um, Jan, I was going to ask you for the communities that had 75%, did they move from a fixed date to 75? I'm wondering if it's unusual to, to move backwards from 50 to 75. Um, you know, to go from something that's a little more restrictive to less restrictive. You mean from 75 to 50? No, that would be more restrictive, right? Going from 75 to 50 would create more properties that you have to deal with. So that would be more restrictive. Exactly. Yeah, and they've, I think that move among those was to go from 50 to 75. And that just to, just to make management. Of... Exactly what we're talking about. I'm okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, I think Robin captured it well, kind of the, the crux yeah. of the issue. And I don't think we need to uh, uh, um, imagine that this will be problematic. I think I had Rob and, and someone in my office like crunch the numbers on how many permits this would capture just in a given month. We went back to, I think, somewhere pre-pandemic just to get a sense. And it was, you know, it was it was hard to really calculate because not everything requires a building permit, but you know it was definitely like you know a, a handful a week that would be captured, and that's you know a significant increase than mm-hmm. than what we have now. And the goal was to make this a bit more streamlined. So that's why I was offering 
some tweaks that could cut filter out that volume, whether it's 50 to 75 or um, looking at this uh, part C of dem demolition. Um, Cause again, I mean, I, the, I just want to be able to implement this effectively and not just be swamped by applications right. and dread, dread. So what you, in 10 <laughs> yeah. years or even in five years, are you going to change it again? Because 75 um, in what, three years is going to be 1950. Um, okay. So then are you going to push it to 80? Uh, or are you going to I mean, hire more staff? you know it's we're not gonna hire more yeah i don't think we'll hire more staff i mean that's I'm, I'm also suggesting we could just pick a point in time and say say before that and not have to change it every few years but that's um, defining historic as a style and not yeah. allowing mid-modern to be considered significant this is where yeah. i just can't yeah yeah i mean not... that's maybe not a problem to change it every five years it's it's easier to change a general bylaw than a zoning but bylaw, changing so. it five years is doing the same thing it's continually trying to keep those houses from being considered significant i mean i i think that i i mean i think i with an effective review i think i would be comfortable with the idea that the um 50 to 5 50 to 75 year you know town inventory is is reviewed for for significance i mean if you can do that and you determine which properties are significant you're kind of done right that we've determined well, there's do that for everything then don't have <coughs> just have a list of properties then right i mean if you're going to do it for the things that are between 50 and 75 years old why not for everything that's older than 50 that's a smaller number and they're probably already on the preservation plan in, in macros or whatever. Um, why have the years if you're going to have an inventory? It's two separate tools, but there, there's really no reason to divide things by year then. I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing because um, getting a fully functioning inventory at all times would be challenging, but getting a functioning inventory for those 25 years might be more possible and manageable. Hmm. And, and the older, you know, the older you get, the more, I don't know, the more significance something might attain, the less um, you might have, um, you know, examples of it within, within the landscape. I mean, I'm just trying to find, you know, the, uh, like the, the town's sweet spot for being able to manage. No, I agree with you, I understand. To manage and, and that, yeah. I just think we're working with a double standard is all. So. I mean, it's a little bit like identifying uh, properties that are 50 years or less. I mean, that exists on the national level that you can, I think you can nominate something for the register that's outside of the guidelines if you can establish you know its mm -hmm. significance so if you've got you know a frank yeah. Geary building and it's 49 years old and somebody wants to tear it down or you know whatever i mean that there there is a a precedent for that kind of model so i guess i'm i'm more comfortable with it in that regard if that's what the town needs to do in order to make this manageable for for all of us because mm -hmm. it really, I mean, the question is really, it's it really comes down to this matter of significance. I think sometimes we get stuck on historic and you know, if you put a lot more weight on the significance of something, it really eliminates, you know, a lot of the properties that are in town, you know, they're historic but they're, you know, significant, then you might not have a, a, a heavy argument for their significance. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, we need to wrap this up. <laughs> so are we, so we've decided that the final one, we know how to deal with that. The second one, we're okay with no change. The this, this three and four were, wanting to leave part c for the moment is that what i got from the general discussion right 
And number one, we have no, no real mm. agreement, I don't think. Um, yeah, I guess to clarify, for number three and four, it's, it's leaving it as it is, but I guess committing to developing this Amherst inventory and part C will only come into effect once the inventory is adopted and accepted. Exactly. Yeah, so, it's um, already, I think, risky enough as it stands because it assumes yeah. an inventory. And and I I go on record uh, uh, thinking fifty years is is the right threshold. And and I don't know whether that hits the sweet spot as we call it, Ben, for <laughs> for the town um, staff, but but. There are significant architectural and interesting um, structures that have been built, um, you know, in, in the in, in fifty years ago, and it's if to us, to 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 some of us on this on this commission, it's it's in our lifetime. To you, it's not, but but to some of us, it is, and and we can't not pay attention to that. Well, again, um, it depends upon the, it, it either depends upon the development of the inventory or we leave it at 50, right? Right. And right. maybe once the inventory is developed, the staff pressure will lessen. You'll have I, I think fun. developing the inventory needs, the Amherst uh, inventory needs to be a high priority for us. Jane. Frankly, I, I think it has to be, um, in a sense, it has to be the highest priority because I don't, I don't think this town is going to accept 50 years, really. I mean, if they're going to have a chance to review it and choose between 50 years and something else, I really don't think that the council is going to approve 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, and besides that, I mean, so let's think for a moment about yeah. the, the, the threshold, but also about the way this bylaw is written, the threshold and the inventory are two different things, right? So, right. and they serve two, in, at least in the bylaw as it's written, they serve two different purposes. However, um, the inventory can certainly be used to um, include buildings um, younger than 75 years, yes. younger than 50 years, and even younger than 20 years. Um, right. But I don't think we can do without an inventory. We've got to get started on that. We, mm -hmm. we need an inventory. It's my opinion that is the highest priority right now. Right. And, and, I, and I whatever we have to do to get this passed. We can start with that list that's appended to the preservation plan. Right. Because I went through that and compared it with macros. Remember when I was years ago, I was doing that. And it's not that far off there. Obviously, there's right. a lot more on macros, but it's a pretty good list. Yeah. So we started with that and then worked it up. And, and then add to it and then add to it. But I think it has to be a high priority because it's essential to this whole preservation plan. Okay, so if you think they aren't gonna go for 50, what are we gonna do? I think, well, my opinion is that I, I, I feel like the sweet spot is 75 years plus an in inventory. And, and then, then in five the, years, we can point to the yes. inventory and say we don't keep changing the years? I think you can, I think the inventory only applies to part C. So, um, that doesn't really affect the threshold, which is, um, you know, really for for all our demolition types. Well, we so, can we can yeah. maybe we need a, an either or for seventy five years, or appears on the Amherst inventory. Yeah, because As, your, your recommendation is a preservation plan to process process to identify. Well, that's that would be the inventory, right? Just right. say so, that. Yeah. Jane, um, I think an either or, or an either and makes sense. Um, be, be, because if if we, um, you know, there, there was a conversation earlier about Echo Hill 
And there's some noted architects who, who designed some of those homes there. Um, and and I, I think they probably fall in the 75 or don't. But, but the fact of the matter is, you know, doing some research on who the architects were there, um, I, I think there are lots of pockets in town that would yield um, houses for the inventory that might not yield for the age. Right. right. And then, so, yes. So we can have an either or as the, like the, the, the basic threshold, but then it's the inventory that's operational for part C. Right. Right. Is this making any sense to you, Ben? Yeah, so basically, yeah, the invent inventory is operational for Part C, but then the, the first threshold is 75 years old, or if it's on the Amherst inventory, and the Amherst inventory could capture properties that are, you know, less than 50 right. years. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. I can see that. That's good. <laughs> I just felt that without that existing, we're creating a period of however long it takes to, to get it in place as a loophole, but. But, but I think we can, if, if creating an inventory is our priority, I think we have lots of resources already in place to do that. Well, uh, we need people who are actually going to do it though. I mean, saying- That's can, my yeah, question. Who, yeah, who will do it? Who does that? Well, you know, I, I, we can use some CPA monies, but, but I, I pulled Thanks. all the, the form Bs for, for the sunset, um, Lincoln, uh, South Whitney, and yeah. and it's it's easy to to if you have an address. Yeah, but that's a really easy. small small section. No, no, no. But, but but it's if you were to go street by street and check macros to see what's there, um, it's possible to do. But most so, of these houses aren't on macros. Right. Right. Well, it's a question of identifying which one should be on macros. Yeah. Right, and then you have to drive them and down the streets. And that's where we need CPA money for a consultant to do that. And that's, that's next year, Robin. That. That's what I was going to say, that we should focus on CPA fund. That's exactly one of the things that CPA funds is, um, is allowable for, is developing inventories that help the town manage its historic uh, uh, inventory. I mean, it's, it's historic resources. It's right there. So that, that is something that we can focus on so that it's not a question of the town doing it or ha and having the time or the volunteers on the commission that it is paid for. We pay for a consultant with a defined timeline. So and we apply we just, in October, we get the money next year, and then we hire somebody. So it's going to be over a year before this even gets started. I, right. I think that so I, I I think that we um, actually do. I mean, we could within two months we could we could approve entries on an Amherst inventory of structures. We we could do that right away uh, with with the at least a, a portion of the list that's in the appendix of the preservation plan or a certain number of structures we pull from macros, just like Pat is saying, we, there is a starting point. We can start the inventory. Um, some of the finer points can be covered by CPA funding for a consultant. For but, all the things that are older, I mean, newer. For yeah. newer or, or for things that have not been identified correctly. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't think it's all or nothing. Um, I, I, think, I think we can start That'll give us some. That'll give us a tool, um, especially for the significant structures. Uh, well, especially for the older structures that we already know are significant. Right. Um, uh, and then um, uh, I don't know. Just, just chop off. You know, we're gonna with our consultant. We'll take. We'll identify and add to the inventory another what. 500 or X number of structures in a six-month period, and then and then keep keep that rolling. 
until Ben tells us, until Ben tells us that that's too many things on the inventory. <laughs> yeah. So should we create a subcommittee to work on this? We have to have people to do this. Is what. I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would I would help with that, and um, me too. I me would, too. Uh, even uh, even when I even when my term ends, I would I would continue to help with it. Yeah, and and I I be I had a beginning with that particular district, yeah. but I think Ben that 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 local historic district was um, doing form B's and other properties in in the district, and so that that could be a beginning core um, of of the inventory. Yep. Yeah, certainly. Uh, those were in the, the ones in the local historic district. Yeah. Right. Or I guess in right. the expansion, in the proposed expansion area. Yeah, I guess I have two questions. One is um, part of the bylaws that uh, in order to add, just so you know, to add properties to the this Amherst inventory, um, you have, it's, we're recommending or part of the bylaws that you have to hold a public hearing and notify the homeowners of, of their addition to this Amherst inventory. Right. Um, and then also, yeah, I guess I would just caution against just assuming everything on Macris is, should be included on the Amherst inventory. I think I want to, I want to get away from just assuming Macris is the holy grail for all things historic. Cause there's a lot of incomplete forms and just, you know, out, outdated stuff on there. And, I guess my, I just, I feel conflicted because I want there to be a robust, you know, complete Amherst inventory of historic resources that includes, you know, that's, that uh, is complete and includes, you know, yeah. potentially thousands of properties. But I also have serious concerns about what that would do for this part C of demolition, which I think the Amherst inventory should really only have like 50 to 100 properties on it to really make that manageable. And if they're um, all going to be older than 75 years, they're not helping us because that's already going to come, or 50 even, is already going to come before us automatically. It well, not for, the, be, not for the Part C removal of important. Well, not for the Part C, yeah. yeah. But if we're trying to use this inventory as a tool to identify things that are newer, right. we can't just use the form B's and macros and the list that's attached to the preservation plan. We have to develop new properties. And that's why I said we need a public awareness kind mm -hmm. of information dissemination somehow yeah. so that people know this is coming along. Because I mean, I can think of a house that's really significant right now. The friends who own it, if I say, they just add in an addition. If I say to them, you know, from now on you do something like that, your house is not just yours anymore it's the towns you know so we have to explain mm -hmm. to people ahead how this is going to work because they are going to all find out that they're being listed mm -hmm. it's a bigger deal i think so there, there <sighs> must be some legal guidance about a uh, uh, town inventory bin that you can investigate for us before we go willy-nilly doing this but but i think it, it's possible for us to do it in a short period of time um, and, and, you know, particularly accessing macros, but there are properties that are 50 years, I mean, 50 years brings us to 1947. So, so there, yeah. yeah, so there, there are properties that are, um, might not be on macros at all. They yep. aren't. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. 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 We're talking about 77, not 47. <laughs> Oh, you're right. Yeah. So, 47 like to 75. 77 is right. 50. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, one thing uh, I'd like to just put out on the table for further conversation at some point Let's is that, that. I, I'm afraid that I have a very different idea of an inventory right. than you do, Ben. Uh, um, I don't it's see good a, a, a 50 building inventory is going to do us. 
Um, well, no, that's what I'm saying, Jane, is I want there to be like a complete, robust, full inventory, but I, I worry what that does to part C of demolition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think, do you think we, do you think we need more time to iron this out before CRC? it goes ahead um yeah i mean i uh it depends yeah i don't know what if you guys think more time would help you process it more and come to a conclusion or you know we can just i've been taking meeting minutes or if you guys wanted to write a memo you could share your thoughts with crc and then let you know ultimately it's their decision i guess but um, and but, I uh, another option might be to limit the list of things in section C that we call um, a, a port and architectural elements. So take out something like stoops and windows. Yes, I, yes, yeah, sure agree. I would agree with that too. Yeah, yep. that yeah. Might help, and then it wouldn't it wouldn't cause so many applicate or so many flagged buildings. We could have a robust inventory. But there'd be fewer times that the building inspector or the building commissioner, the staff, then would have to send it over for consideration under C. Yeah, I think windows are important, stoops are less so. Porches, chimneys, fences, I would take out stone wall, I don't know, and similar elements, you know, and walls. I don't know what you mean by walls. Is that the same thing as stone walls? Because other the walls of the structure are part of the 25%. Yeah, but um I mean, it's it walls. Yeah, walls, roof structures, doors, windows, stoops, porches, chimneys. Here I'll, I'll bring it up. Yeah. Fences, stone walls. Yeah. And similar elements, except for replication or reconstruction. Oh you know? yeah, it does. Okay. <sighs> I mean, you could even say something like including roof structure, doors, porches and chimneys and similar elements. And then it would be completely your discretion with whether you even put it under C or just not even consider it. Yeah. Um... Is, is there a way to make that more general? Um, because 25% is, is B, and if C could be just more general, not included somehow in the 25%, does that make sense? So that we don't have to sit here and say each element? Well. Yeah, but then it becomes our job, I guess, to determine what uh, to send to the yeah, commission. Yeah, okay. But, but I think this yeah. is in, dish, in addition to the 25% of the facade, yeah. et cetera. And, it's like and, if somebody doesn't affect 25% of a building, but it has a gabled roof and they just take it off and make a flat roof on a building that should have a gable because it's a Greek revival or something. We want right. a roof for that because it's a significant architectural feature, but it's not 25% of the elevation. Right. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't limit that. I, I would leave that as it's written. Mm -hmm. well, I think you could take some of those words out and it would help. Help you um, narrow well, better that they're there than than trying to quibble about. Right. Something that isn't there, you know, if it, if it's if it's written in this demolitions part C, then either you address it or you or you don't have to. Well then it takes us right back to the same problem that we're trying well, to see. I don't know that that's a problem. Quite honestly. <laughs> for staff I don't know. It is. <laughs> well for staff it is, but you know what? Um we're we're trying to preserve. And these are all the the elements that that um, are characteristic of, of a structure. And yeah, so- but back a few years ago, before you were on the commission, we used to meet 
almost every week for three or four hours. I mean, there were so many things that Whoa. came before us before the building commissioner was given the authorization to make the decision to not bring it to us, or we were quickly going through. I mean, it, it's going to add up if you're, it, I think right. Ben has but, a bad but, point. The, the difference, Jan, is that that we're talking, I mean, the, the preamble to this is for buildings listed on the Amherst inventory. We're not right. talking about every every application. And so it's incumbent upon us to get an Amherst inventory. Right. That, Which that is it reasonable and small that we agree with. Or a right. And then it narrows it down right away. Yeah. Well, okay. And so I'm uh, may I ask, I think I saw this somewhere. Um, sorry, I'm changing the subject, but it's still about the bylaw. Um, <laughs> um, did, I see, did I see somewhere that we wanted to um, remove the word structure? No, that was miswritten and we all misunderstood what you meant. Oh. Um, he yes, there said, were. He said um, that he it should stay as it is. Stay as is, yeah. Okay. Rather than he's saying, if we did, it would this would happen, blah blah blah. Okay. He, did, he just wrote it in a way that was, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, back to the thorny issue. <laughs> <laughs> Comic relief there for a second. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> uh, um, ben, do you know when the the um, CRC might return? Oh, they're going to return to this what next week or? Yeah. yeah, I think it's as soon as. Let me check my calendar. Maybe May. A May week 4th. from week May from May rings a bell. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think there is a? So if we had a subgroup to try and sort of tweak all of this to make it mesh and line up, is that, can we do that? Or is that an open meeting law thing? Um, if, if, it's a, if it's a posted meeting or just, you know, at, not in a posted meeting? Not in a posted meeting. I mean, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get at is if CRC is meeting on May 4th, that's not much time for us to, to try and sort of consolidate this discussion and, and kind of iron out the inventory mm -hmm. question and, and a, something that resembles a plan to kind of develop the inventory. Right. Um, we had a yeah. bylaw subcommittee that worked on the bylaws. I mean, we could have a right. subcommittee working. Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah. So, that's valid. I think it's actually May 12th is their next. Oh, meeting. even better. Okay. Or actually, wait, sorry. Uh, April 28th is actually before that. Oh, that's in a few days. Okay. It's Thursday, a week from Whoa. tomorrow. Yeah, so I, do you remember at the CRC meeting, um, Mandy said April 28th is the next meeting, but if that's you feel right. like you guys need more time, um, they could do May 12th as the, as the next discussion. Okay, let's let's take it. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, say yes. <laughs> and I I'd be happy to work on this with someone. Or I'm going to be away, away. so I will I won't be here for a week. And this weekend I'm dealing with a death in the family, so I'm not available. I'm sorry. So what you want to do is just make it clearer. Um, yeah, I want what I'd like yeah. to do is. Um, better define the purpose of an inventory how, and how okay. it can function and um, maybe clean up that section C, mm -hmm. um, introduce the idea of either 75 years or on the inventory. Mm -hmm. So that we have a clear recommendation that would be put into the bylaw all the wording ready to go yeah because i think i i think that that 
that there, there's this kind of negotiation with, uh, I, I like the way you described this earlier, Ben, with the levers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think adjust it, making these little adjustments to these levers um, could make this bylaw more understandable or more acceptable to a broader, uh, a broader town audience, including those that ultimately pass the bylaw. Yeah, it's and more efficient for the staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so that's another reason to take a little bit more time, and that is to, you know, have, um, involve you, Ben, in, in, you know, understanding what the impact is on the staff so that yeah. we yeah. actually achieve what we're trying mm -hmm. to achieve. Mm -hmm. Robin, would you have time to work with Jane on that? Since you understand a lot of this stuff pretty well. Um, I am in the last two weeks of my semester, so. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, I have some availability, but after the 2nd of May, I'm not available at all for two weeks. So just, you know, let me know if I can be helpful. Okay. Um, so uh, perhaps I can get in touch with you, Pat, and you, Becky, if you if you can look at some. I, I would be willing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So next end of next week, I don't get to talk for five days. So. <laughs> oh. Really? So I'll send you some. I'll send you some email and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll figure we'll figure it out. And I, I'm sorry that Jan's going to be away. And and sympathies to you with the death in your family, Jan. Um, Absolutely. And Robin, good luck with the end of your semester and your career. And I mean, you've got a lot of lot of uh, spokes on your wheel. It sounds like. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we need to go back to the um, agenda because <laughs> oh. this item is sort of being um, tabled. I've lost the agenda again. I've got too many open windows. Um, the agenda was just to brief update on the preservation plan and then the West Cemetery Headstone project. Oh, great. Yeah. So all I can say about the preservation plan is that uh, uh, the contract is set to start on May 1st. So, and it's going to be a 12 month process so um technically i think the pvpc like executive board which meets once a month still needs to approve the contract and they're meeting on the 25th so next week but you know they um it's been approved by all the you know the executive director at pvpc so um we expect shannon to get underway on may i guess monday may 2nd and then she's coming in for a meeting with town staff uh, in, on May 12th. And then I think um, she's a little bit, was un, unavailable in the evenings and at, towards the end of May, but she's gonna come to the commission meeting, the commission meeting in June to meet, have a kind of kickoff meeting. Um, so whenever that date is, um, we'll have Shannon Walsh from PVPC joining us. And, Great. Um, ben, does, uh, with all this discussion of inventory and how this can be partially managed through the preservation plan update, is that um, I'm not, not clear, I don't have the RFP in front of me, but is that, or, um, is that an addition to their work or is that already included in there? Um, it's included in the scope of work, but maybe, you know, we can okay. place a stronger emphasis on it. I mean, I don't want to lose sight of all the other tools in yeah. that we have available and, and you know, the mm -hmm. important like educational and outreach, you know, work that we want to do and um, more proactive, you know, management of historic resources in town. But I think the inventory um, is also an, an important part. So okay. yeah, that, that it's, it's included in the RFP, so yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, is there, are there any questions, other, other questions about the preservation plan? One other, um, Shannon asked me to ask, um, the, the first 
task in the preservation plan is to have her look review some other towns preservation plans to kind of get a sense of you know in the past five years what plans have been developed and if there's any tidbits to take from those plans or either just the approach and she asked me if uh if there are any towns they'd recommend we'd recommend her looking at kind of at a similar scale and you know amount of resources as Amherst I guess I think um, Jan had recommended Concord to me over email and unfortunately Concord doesn't really have a preservation plan they have a historic resource like inventory with some management plans and they have a like 19 like literally 19 like 80 like preservation plan that's really outdated but yeah it was interesting I was like even Concord doesn't really have a I had also plan, said to Ben that we've used Newton a lot in the past, and now when I'm yeah. Newton, I have to say it's not a bit like Amherst. Yeah, yeah. It's huge, and it's multi-million dollar houses, and it's and it's slum apartments. It's everything, and it's, yeah. it's two sides of it's yeah two sides of a interstate. I mean, it's just not. It doesn't seem comparable, um, and I'm sure some of the things along Route Two might be better. You know, some of those towns or yeah. Um, hey, uh, Robin, do you happen to know if Preservation Massachusetts kind of keeps up with communities that are doing preservation plans? Oh, you're muted. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, but what about, um, I was just trying to think of something in the Berkshires, would oh, Great, yeah. Barring Great Barrington? Yeah, yeah. That might be good. we can look, yeah. look westward. <laughs> yeah, or north of Cambridge, you know, up in like, uh, I'm thinking of like Harvard, Massachusetts, some of those little towns up in there. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that Great Barrington has the same kind of, um, you know, it's it's a community with some some money. It's about it's a similar size and well, a little bit larger downtown, but. Um, or Lee. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll see what. Not all these places necessarily have preservation plans, but I can look to see what's available. Or Gloucester. Yeah. Or on the scene yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Great. Uh, Jane, are you running the meeting or why? I'm not sure. <laughs> you still are. I am. Okay. What about the West Cemetery headstones? Quick. You have one second. <laughs> one second. <laughs> It's, hap it's happening. How about that? <laughs> Yay, great. Any public comment out there? Do we have anybody waiting to talk this interminable meeting? <laughs> Hilda's been with us. Oh, poor thing. <laughs> I will say for the for West Cemetery, the uh, I met with the consultants today. They've been out there. Um, they're gonna, they've been kind of surveying and, and recording kind of which headstones they're gonna approach and, and, and how they're gonna fix them. And um, they, uh, they're gonna start with the African-American section to hopefully have that um, cleaned up by the Juneteenth holidays Great. and celebrations. And, um, and then they'll shift their focus to the 1870s section. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll definitely keep you posted on on their work there, there's a lot to do we walked through there they're left and right there's headstones either crumbling or falling off so <laughs> yeah. so is hilda there no so we don't have anybody waiting to no public comment yeah okay any anticipated items um looks like we have a hand here from Hilda. I'm here, but I have nothing to say. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to put in the indie from this long conversation. Uh, yeah. Good luck. When you figure it out, could you let us know? Because maybe it'll help us decide what we decided. <laughs> uh, the one thing that's on my brain is the article that was in the newspaper today by Scott. And I just hope that you will be as interested in as 
profound, deeply thinking about preserving our 1928 library, because a lot of us are very worried about another edition of Lost Amherst devoted to Jones Library. If you don't know Lost Amherst, it's still being printed at Hastings. I'm told it's still there. It was done by the Historical Commission in the 70s when they founded the East Amherst Historic District. Anyway, we don't want another volume of all the photos from the interior of the Jones because that's all there is that's left. So I'm, I'm counting on you guys to help us. And apparently it's going to be on your agenda very shortly. That's all. Well, Otherwise, thanks, Thank you. And we um, have a meeting date. The yeah. Yes, yeah, so the next meeting will be on May 18th. I guess I can give a sneak preview of that. We'll, be, we'll look at the 37 North Pleasant Street demolition. As a reminder, I think, uh, I guess it was only Becky who wasn't on the commission at that point, but we did look at that in March, 2021. Um, but uh, so, you know, I encourage you to read the meeting minutes and watch the recording if you need a refresher. Um, and, but obviously we do have new commission members. So, you know, could always, um, you know, be a different conversation, I guess. Um, and then the, so the Jones Library Preservation Restriction um, has been signed. It's uh, off at MHC right now, Mass Historic Commission for their uh, approval and, and, and signatures. Um, still, I think we're kind of operating as if it's in place, which I think makes sense. And the trustees agree with that as well. So the um, proposal we'll review at the May 18th meeting is for the relocation of the garden, the Kinsey garden, which is in the back of the library uh, in preparation for the renovation project there. Um, proactively like moving the, the plants from the garden to uh, the Kestrel Land Trust property. And so the, the garden, the, the, that removal of the garden is considered a major landscaping change, which does uh, fall into the preservation restriction. So um, we can get more into the, how that review will take place, but essentially you'll need to give your approval for that project kind of basing the decision on how it impacts the historic 1928 facade um, um, exterior portion. So again, it's not, I guess, to discern, it's not the garden, I guess, that is the historic resource, but it's the how it impacts the property overall. So that'll be the focus of the next meeting. And, um, and then maybe add an agenda item for the outcome of the subcommittee and the CRC meeting and what we've been talking about tonight. Yeah. Report. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Jane, this is your chance to move to adjourn. You never get to do that. I never do. <laughs> <laughs> or I, or I, for some reason, I think I'm not supposed to, but, but I know I've seen other committees work where the chair does. Well, we swapped work. roles tonight, so you get to be me. Okay, well, I move to adjourn. Anyone second? And I second. The motion passes, I think, unless anybody's going to fight it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Right. Motions to adjourn right. are not debatable. Good night. Thank <laughs> you. Good, night. good night, everybody. See you next night. month. Take care. Bye.